Len, what is it about consciousness that led you to focus on the unconscious? Consciousness is a very difficult problem. We don't even know how to define consciousness really scientifically from the scientific point of view. But unconsciousness, strangely, the flip side of consciousness is, is much easier to define. We just talk about it as being um, having to do with processes in your brain that you're not aware of, that you don't have control over, that come automatically. And so I thought that one way of looking at consciousness is to look at the unconscious mind. And the more I got into it, I, I realized that this is really, really interesting because these are things that go on in your brain that govern your behavior and your perceptions of other people and the world that, that, that determine really who you are as a person that you have no idea are going on or, or have no control over. So it's actually, in a way, I mean, I, I have more, I'm more, much more in touch with my conscious thoughts, and I can kind of think about that and, and get a handle on that. And what was a surprise to me was the whole world of unconscious thoughts that go on in your brain. Mm. Let's try to categorize the different components of the unconscious. You're talking about uh, uh, behavioral and emotional aspects, but there are bodily regulatory functions, there are coordination of muscular movements. How do you, how do you kind of... Uh, uh, organize the study of the unconscious? Well, loosely speaking, you, you can organize it in an evolutionary way. There's the ancient unconscious, the reptilian brain. Mm -hmm. there are, those are the, uh, your, your, your um, bodily functions of flight, uh, fight or flee behavior. Um, and those are present in lower animals as well as in, in humans. But I was really more interested in the emotional unconscious and the unconscious that, that is more uh, specific to humans, or at least to primates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do we begin to understand those things? Well, th there are many different facets of it. So people who study it usually study one area or another. Some people study vision, unconscious vision. Uh, how how you're, you when when you see it when you see a scene, obviously light is impinging on on your eyes, going to your retina, being transferred to your visual cortex, and your your brain is making a picture out of it, but there, there's no picture in your brain. The picture that you see does not exist in your brain. It's a code amongst neural network. And some of the processing, a lot of the processing that goes on in your brain is unconscious processing, processing that, that even blind people have. Mm -hmm. So for instance, there's a phenomenon called blind sight, where people who feel completely blind, who are perceptually blind, who cannot tell you what they're seeing, can still perceive certain things. Mm -hmm. They can, for instance, they, there's an experiment where they take a man who had a, um, two strokes, bilateral um, damage in his visual cortex and, and couldn't see uh, uh, in either left or the right field of vision. And they had him walk down a hall with obstacles and he agreed to do this. Mm -hmm. And he managed to avoid the obstacles yeah. even though he couldn't consciously perceive yeah. the obstacles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, many years ago, there was a study of uh, someone in World War I who had a bullet go through his brain and uh, could not perceive anything on the left side of his field of vision except for motion. But he couldn't tell, that he couldn't see that anything was there, but he had a funny feeling when something was moving. So in vision, there is a lot of study of unconscious vision. But there's unconscious processes that go on in memory. There's unconscious processes that go on in, in communication. Nonverbal communication is a very big area. Yeah, what, what are some of the examples in either one of those? Well, for instance, in nonverbal communication, uh, uh, human beings have a special part of their brain that's been specialized to uh, recognize faces. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's very important, uh, it, uh, evolutionarily, it was very important to know who your friends are, to recognize your friends, to recognize your enemies, because humans are a very social animal. And our speech, we think of our speech as being very important, our verbal communication, but we all have a lot of nonverbal communication. You can tell from the look on someone's face a lot about what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. You can watch a movie and even tell, if you watch a movie in a foreign language, you can tell from the intonations of the language, even though you don't understand the words, what the emotion is. Mm -hmm. Touch, touch is also very important. Um, human beings relate socially to each other a lot by, by simple touch. There, there's experiments of, uh, for instance, waiters in restaurants. And they, will, uh, they, they had one group of waiters act normally with their customers, and the other group were instructed to give a very short, one-second, minor little glancing touch to, on the shoulder you know, <laughs> to their customers. <laughs> And they got significantly more tips. Yeah. And there's a lot of studies like that showing that, that, that touch is a way of, of connecting with somebody. Mm -hmm. So as humans, we have a lot more than the verbal communication that we, that we know through language, but we have a lot of ways of communicating non-verbally. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what, what about some of the, the Freudian kinds of unconscious, uh, which is very controversial in terms of uh, behaviors or experiences that we've had in childhood or at other times that, that have significant influences on how we feel and what we do? Well, Freud was very important in that he 
he popularized the idea of the unconscious, and he, he really brought it to the forefront of uh, culture, of people's thinking. Uh, his, his views in, in the, academic, the academic community doesn't really place a lot of weight on his views, at least today. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, his views were, of course, taken up by uh, clinical psychologists, but, but in academic psychology, there hasn't been a lot of evidence for most of the phenomena that, that he was thinking about. Mm-hmm. And, and Freud wasn't really a scientist. He didn't do experiments to test his ideas. He, he intuited them in, from discussions with people. He analyzed uh, his patients. But uh, I think the modern view is that there wasn't a lot there in, uh, in terms of uh, insight. Mm. So uh, w- what are some of the uh, kind of the emotional impacts that, uh, that unconscious uh, um, things have on our, our feelings that we are not we don't perceive? Well, emotions are very interesting because your, your emotional feelings are, have a conscious component where you go, I feel bad because something happened. Mm-hmm. And they have a, a physiological, somatic component where your body is reacting because something happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is the interplay between those two. It seems to be that your, your bodily reaction comes first and your consciousness interpret your bodily reaction in terms of the context and decides how you're feeling from that. Uh. So, so for instance, there was a famous study where people were told that they were participating in an experiment. And the experiment was to test uh, the effects of a certain drug. They called it uh, suproxen. It was really adrenaline, yeah. and they didn't know that. And one group of uh, subjects was given a placebo, a second group was given the suproxen, but told that this will make your heart race and it'll make you feel a little um, uh, aroused. Mm-hmm. And the other group was told, this won't have any effect on you. Then they were, they were given the injection, they were told they have to wait in a little waiting room for the, and then the experimenter will come in and, and talk to them. And in the waiting room was another supposed subject who yeah. was really a, a, in collusion with the experimenters. And this subject, was behaved in one of two ways. For some of the, su- for some of the uh, subjects, he would behave very angry, like, why are they making us wait so long? This is a stupid experiment. Yeah, yeah. And for others, he would behave euphorically, like, oh, isn't it great that we're participating yeah. in research, we're helping science? Yeah. And the question was, would, how would this affect the people with the bodily reactions? Would they, would they think that they were angry? The ones who had the suproxen mm-hmm. didn't know what the side effects were and felt aroused. Would they interpret that arousal as anger when with the angry person yeah. or, or, or euphoria when they were with the euphoric person yeah. based on the context? Yeah, yeah. And they did. The, the, the ones who had the arousal but knew that it was a side effect of the drug didn't feel those emotions because they had the physiological arousal but their brain had a, a context for it. And of course, the uh, control group didn't feel them either. So this is just a demonstration of how our conscious mind interprets our bodily reactions and puts the emotion on top of that. And so the, the, uh, the bodily reactions comes from unconscious uh, uh, Right, reactions. it comes from very ancient unconscious reactions to, right. to and so danger that, or, or... Right, and, and, then, and, and it may be some suppressed things. We don't even know what's causing it. There's some early trauma that resonates with something we see here that, that causes a reaction. But then our consciousness reacts to that reaction and that's what we, we interpret in, in as our, our emotions. Active, right. our, our so, so our emotions have a large unconscious component. Mm-hmm. We're not always aware of why we're feeling, mm-hmm. how we're feeling. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we can misinterpret that and get in trouble. Mm-hmm. I, I, mean, I talked to uh, an editor who had told me that he had a horrible argument with this agent. And he said that he normally uh, doesn't have these fights with, with this agent. They have a great relationship. And somehow th- th- this the negotiation became very contentious. And he realized afterwards that he had had, just prior to that, a rather unpleasant discussion, and the emotion was still carrying on yeah. in him. His bodily yeah. condition was still stressed right. out and right. you know, ready, uh, loaded for bear, you would say. <laughs> right. And he, then when the agent said things to him, he interpreted them as pissing him off yeah. and, and thought he was reacting to her that yeah. way. And I thought that was very interesting. Right, right. I think we all have events in our own lives that we can resonate with. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes before you go home... <laughs> 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 Calm down from the day's work. 